Is there a war coming in the Middle East? Are we headed toward a one world government, a one world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble? The end of the world as we know it, and what are the increase of UFO sightings? While we may disagree as to what is causing the phenomenon, we can agree that it is real burgeoning and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warns us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting and stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. This is Acceleration Radio. Thanks for keeping it um, on your list of things to do on Thursday night. Great to be here. Lots to go on. There is no guest tonight. And the reason for that is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, several um, things have come to my attention. The first thing is so much is happening in the world right now that I felt the need to hog the whole entire hour and address some of these uh, developments myself rather than bringing on a guest and discussing their book or their research. I just think we're at a very pivotal point right now, uh, and not only in America, but certainly in the world. The overview, as I see it, folks, is not looking good. For instance, the Chinese um, yuan is at a record all-time high against the dollar. The dollar is highly inflated, $17 trillion in debt. We are at, at least at least that much right now. Obama is getting set to raise taxes. Since Obama has taken office, he has um, legislated uh, about 120, perhaps more now, regulations. Um, they're also talking about this 2,500-page Obamacare, which is extremely onerous and basically gives government control of pretty much all facets of our lives. And, and combined with that, ladies and gentlemen, there has been uh, a secession uh, movement in the United States. I think it's up to about 22 now uh, uh, different states which are trying to get the signatures uh, to secede from the union. Now that's not going to happen. That's it, let, let's let's understand something that um, Texas will not, at least not now, secede from the union. But here's where it gets it gets dangerous. We've had that happen once before, where states uh, in mass seceded from the union. That was called the Civil War. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, where the southern states. Uh, broke away from the northern states, and the, the the Civil War was to keep the Union together. Read Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is just amazing. We are at a point in this country where there is a such disparity between ideologies, specifically those uh, who call themselves progressives, who want abortion on demand, a large government sort of a Western Europe nanny state uh, type of affair who believe in gay marriage, and those on the other side, to, to, to just, you know, those are some of the fighting points, shall we say, but certainly big government is, is, the, is the one that is nanny state, big government, uh, Western Europe type um, arrangement. Um, and then on the other side, we have a traditionalist. The traditionalists are those who believe um, in traditional marriage, um, who don't agree with abortion on demand, think that life begins at conception, um, and, you know, I, I had an interesting, let me just talk about the abortion thing for a second. I had an interesting discussion with a gentleman yesterday <clears throat> who was telling me his girlfriend was saying, surely, I mean, all these people who are pro-life, they're, they're just Neanderthals. I mean, I mean, get with the times. I mean, things have changed. Come on. You know, for a century. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to him talk about his girlfriend. I'm just like saying to myself, herein lies the problem. This woman more than likely has done and I don't know because I haven't met her, but I'm assuming that she's done absolutely zero research on the subject, has no idea that life, in fact, does begin at conception, probably has never looked at an ultrasound of, a, of an eight-week or 12-week-old uh, uh, baby in a mother's womb, certainly. Um, would, and what does she side with? Partial birth abortion? Late-term abortions? I mean, it's just insane. It's such a slippery slope, and already we've killed 53 million of them, and this country, 1 billion worldwide. And the left for the most part is the party of let's abort and kill all the babies that we possibly can and when we begin to touch on the subject the women scream back a woman's right to choose and I say it's not a woman's right to choose and I mean I'll just I'll say that to the cows come home why is it a woman what about the unborn child in the mother's womb what about that human being's life they get no choice they just get killed 
That's insane. That's insane. And I understand, you know, people go, what about rape and incest? Okay, what about rape and incest? You know, is the child in the womb the product of rape and incest? Is that child guilty of that, of that charge, guilty of that crime? Of course not. The child is the innocent byproduct of that crime. So what should happen? In my, in, in my opinion, the child should be brought full term, and that baby should be given away, should be adopted by um, some other by some other family. Why not that? Instead of just arbitrarily killing the unborn. Let's say that child, uh, let's just hypothetically pose a situation. Let's say that in that child's DNA makeup, we get the one in a billion. We get um, an Einstein. But this, this child, if he's not aborted, will discover the cure for cancer. You see what I mean? Now, I realize it's a hypothetical, and people go, well, that's just a hypothetical. But, but what if? I mean, I've, I often, I've often heard this story um, about Beethoven. Beethoven is born into a family, uh, or the mother of Beethoven is pregnant. I've already given you the punchline. Um, there's eight, eight children. There's a whole bunch of siblings. They're poor. Um, there's syphilis, all this, all this crazy. I mean, in other words, it's the last... From our standards, you go, oh, my God, eight kids, you know, Beethoven, no way, you know, don't <laughs> abort the baby. Well, if you do that, you're just born, you're just aborted, you know, Beethoven. And, and that's my whole point, folks. It's like, where, where do we draw the line here? And how, do we, how can we possibly play God at, at this juncture? We can't. And yet, 53 million of them will all the land. And these women hold up these signs, I want rights to choose, and they're rabid about it. I mean, they're rabid about it. Sit them down and show them the movie Silent Scream. Let them see what it is they are actually doing. Let's take it out of the realm of theory and bring it, you know, into the realm of not only science, but reality. When we look at what happens during an abortion. But I digress, and I just wanted to sort of touch that, touch over that a little bit before, before we move on. The country is in a very tenuous state in the sense we're static we are highly divided and i just spoke of, of of the the paradigm or the differences i should say between the left the progressives and the traditionalists and this is what is bringing about these petitions to secede from the union now is this going to happen look i don't have a crystal ball but i will say this um and i'm not a prophet if Obamacare is implemented by 2014, you will see, the, I believe, some of the greatest demonstrations that we've ever seen in this country. Not since the Vietnam War will we see the type of demonstrations that the American people will engage in. Hopefully they will be peaceful, but we all know how demonstrations can be. And unfortunately, there's always a few hotheads. But the bottom line is this bill, which was passed... Um, by a House and Senate that was controlled by the Democrats, which was never read, which was never debated, which was railroaded through, is completely against everything that representation and their constitution really and, and the way government, the way this government was founded on should be. And this is the subject of a blog, which I have not yet written. I may wait and write it um, in my news magazine. But the bottom line is this. We are at the end game in America. This is the end game in America. I'm often asked, why is it in America uh, included in biblical prophecy? And there's a reason for that, ladies and gentlemen. America is not included in biblical prophecy because America is not part of biblical prophecy. It's taken down. We are taken down and out of the fray. And I write about this in the book, Politics, Prophecy, and the Supernatural. That is a theory, but it's a theory based on the fact that the, the Bible specifically does not have anything in America at all. The only scripture, and it's sort of very elusive, um, that talks about America, that may talk about America, is when it says, and all her young lions, uh, Tarshish and all her young lions. That's it. That's all you can point to. And, and so, you know, people say, well, that's Great Britain and we're the young lions. Like, I get all that. I get all that. And New York is Babylon. Good luck. Let me know how that works, works out for you. Is America spiritual Babylon? Of course. I, I, would, I would concur with that. But somehow something's going to happen in this country where is it broken up into four or five different countries? Like there's talk of, of California being split to Northern California and Southern California, like North Carolina, South Carolina. It could happen. 
It could happen. Look, anything's possible. But the government was founded. We fought the American Revolution because we were being taxed to death by the British crown. Taxation without representation. Patrick Henry stood up and said, give me liberty or give me death. Um, the British were coming in unannounced into people's homes and um, without knocking, without a warrant, just coming in and dragging people off to prison without bringing charges against them. This is the right of habeas corpus. That right was now suspended by our government. Last year, I believe on New Year's Eve, Obama signed it into law. There wasn't even any debate. Now they can deem anyone as a terrorist. Um, look, if I have a vegetable garden, I can be deemed a terrorist, okay? If I hoard food and water, I can be deemed a terrorist. And by the way, a little sidebar here. Um, there's a, uh, uh, in the other news section on the blog today, uh, or I should say on Wednesday, it says Red Cross response to Sandy fails to meet expectations. I blogged about this before. The idea of self-reliance or waiting for, you know, the suck on the big fat government tit. What are we going to do here? It's just unbelievable. And it's like the people, unfortunately, in New Jersey, they had a week to prepare for the storm. Almost a week to prepare for the storm. And many of them did not. Many of them did not prepare. And so now we get all these people, you know, whining and complaining. Where's my blanket? Where's my food? Where's this? Look, America was founded on the principles of self-reliance. That's how we were founded. There was no nanny state in, you know, in 1789 or 1815, or 1830. There was no nanny state. Government wasn't sitting there going, dishing out 47 million food stamps to the people. It's just insane where we are. It didn't happen. People were self-reliant. Look, I understand a, a catastrophic illness. That's, that's where the churches should step up and help support, you know, in the local community. It should be a local thing, in my opinion, not the government. So what do we see with getting back on pointer? Red Cross comes in dismal failure. FEMA comes in, dismal failure, according to uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, and on and on it goes. So what we see is the country was founded on the idea of self-reliance, and we went to war with the British crown to end taxation without representation and to the end these egregious offenses like uh, not having the right of habeas corpus and illegal search and seizures. When we, and we go to the airport, we are, our stuff is searched and seized illegally. It's happened to me several times when the buzzer goes off randomly at TSA. I am pulled to the side. I am not allowed to touch my stuff, okay? Not allowed. There's no probable cause here. The alarm went off. It's a random alarm. And a guy comes up and goes, I'm going to take your computer. Doesn't ask me. I'm going to take your computer and swab it. Is that okay? What am I supposed to say? No, it's not okay. Good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you. So, as my friend Richard Grun would say. So, he takes the computer, he squabs it. Of course, there's nothing there, and I'm allowed to go. Here's your computer back, blah, blah, blah. I gather my things. I'm basically treated like a criminal. There's no probable cause here. But because Americans have laid down and allowed this to happen under the ridiculous guise of 9-11, now we get searched and seized. What's next? Search and seizure at train stations? How about blockades going from state? to state that's probably going to happen in the not too distant future there was actually a poll taken which was which was shown on drudge report which said that 30 percent of those surveys would consent to a cavity search by tsa in order to fly an airplane i mean that's it we go in the cavity searches i'm gone folks that's it i'm out of here i'm out of here but in the meantime you see Obama gets elected, gun sales again reach an all-time high. Why is it that the American people, a certain segment of it, feel the need to get guns? Reason for that. And then you got Hillary Clinton going, oh, we just should ban all guns. Well, that's what the if you look at history, if we examine history, we can see that in every repressive um, total totalitarian regime, the first thing that they, they, they do is they go after the elite, the intelligentsia, and round them up and either kill them or throw them in the concentration camps. Look at the look what happened in China and Russia and Nazi Germany. And the second thing they do, and they do these things basically in, in lockstep formation, one, two, is to round up all the guns so the citizens can't possibly get a citizen army uh, or raise some sort of a, a militia against a repressive regime. Happens over and over and over and over again. Uh, America will never give up her guns. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and, and, of course, all the, all the, the nonsense about, um, you know, people, well, guns kill people. No, no, no. People kill people. And when you're in Texas, and I've been in Texas, and everybody's packing, you know what? 
Not a lot of people do stuff in tech just because they know everybody's packing. Nobody's going to stand up or burst into a theater and open fire and kill, you know, 30, 40, 50 people like the crazy Batman shooter did, right? Or, um, you know, Jared Lofner, uh, the same deal. If people are packing, uh, it's a whole different deal. You know, you go there with the idea that I'm going to get shot if I start, if I take out my, uh, you know, my pistol and start shooting people, someone's going to shoot me. You better believe it. Now, that's the Wild West attitude, and I'm not, I'm not condoning that. But the bottom line is it is a deterrent. It is a deterrent. And if you're not armed and you're afraid of firearms, I suggest you go out and take a gun class, my wife and I did, learn about, about the weapon of your choice, and go to the firing range. Frankly, I have, a, I have several, several armaments, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I do have one. I have a 22 long. It's a semi-auto, and I love going to the range and just target shooting. I have a scope on it, and, you know, just it's, it's a fun thing to do. My wife and I go and do that periodically, and it sort of keeps us uh, trained with the weapon and, and learn how to clean it handle it and, and be experienced with it um you know it's it's a responsibility it's not you don't give a loaded gun to a four-year-old duh and if you're if we're unsure of how uh weapons work we should go take a gun class but look all that to say this that the country is armed and there's a reason for this there's a reason why people are stockpiling food and folks i said this before and i'll say it again if you have not stockpiled four to six months worth of food you need to do that Get a seed bank going. Get a water supply happening. Uh, try to find like-minded people in the event of an emergency where you can pull your resources together. You see, no one does that, uh, you know, before in, at, at Hurricane Sandy, except a few people who were prepared, and those people get to feed their neighbors. Gee, because their neighbors were stupid and didn't do anything. Look, things are coming. You know, we're in a time, a period where we see earthquakes and floods and famines and all droughts and all this weird weather stuff. And I believe it's because we are in the birth pangs. So the idea of this, folks, is that let's prepare now. Let's do due diligence now. Let's be good Boy Scouts. Let's dare to prepare, as Holly Dale would say. Let's dare to prepare, 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 prepare. Let's do it. Let's get the, 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 the resources that we need to sustain our loved ones and, of course, ourselves in the, in the event of an emergency. Um, if a 9.0 earthquake happens outside Los Angeles, it's going to be devastating. I'm at the 1,000-foot mark in the mountains, so I'm not really concerned about a tsunami. If there's a pole shift, we're all dead anyway, so who cares? But a normal tsunami, even if it's something, you know, 100 feet high, is not going to reach me. It's just not going to happen here. But if we get a tsunami 75, 100 feet like, like they had uh, in Fukushima where that tsunami wave was about 75 feet high, that puppy's going to roll in and it's, it's going to wipe out the West Coast. If it's down in Los Angeles area, forget about it. That's all flat. Um, that's all flat land in there. It's one big basin. And that, the wave would probably even get into the San Fernando Valley. There's been some scenarios where the whole area is totally flooded. Certainly, if it happens north of me, that whole floodplain of Camarillo, which basically is at, at sea level, that's all wiped out. That's all gone. So, again, we need to stockpile food and water. It's a good thing. But getting back to the secession, there is a deep angst. There's a feeling of unrest. There's a feeling of, oh, my gosh, this government is so onerous, so oppressive that we're losing more and more of our freedoms. If health care goes in, and I'm, again, I'm not a prophet, if health care is actually implemented in this country and people realize what has just happened, I believe, I believe there will be major, major dissent all through this country. That's, what, that, that's my take on it, folks. That's my I hope I'm wrong. I hope that cool heads prevail. And hear what I'm saying for those government agents who are listening in right now. Gee, welcome to the communist states of the USA. But the bottom line is, listen to me, folks, that I hope that the, the matter is resolved peacefully and that Democrats and Republicans can review the bill and, and, and make it so it, it works, not some onerous, you know, big brother type deal. But I don't have a lot of confidence in that. And we'll have to see to see what happens. Remember, the progressives want a huge government uh, beast on our backs, an onerous state fund, funded, onerous state overseeing um, governmental agency that, that basically conducts what we're going to do um, and tells us what we're going to do, cradle to grave. And I, I just reject that outright. I mean, I really do. I just reject that philosophy outright. I don't want, you know, my hero, Judge Napolitano, has stated when he had his show, a government is best that governs least. I'll say it again. A government is best that governs least. And that's what I certainly uh, um, would hold to. 
Anyway, folks, I'm going to take a little break here. We're almost at the half hour um, spot. And um, I want to come back and I want to talk about World War III, the update, what has just happened uh, yesterday, Wednesday, with the, with the Gaza airstrike. Um, we are pre-recording this. It is Wednesday. And uh, we are pre-recording this uh, broadcast. But we're going to take a little break here right now. And keep it right here. You're listening to Acceleration Radio on the Fringe Radio Network. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. When we get back, we'll talk about the possibility of World War III. Buy the Oldest Enemy by Michael J. Webb, now available at Amazon.com. An ancient evil will be released upon the world, an epic battle between light and darkness. Only one man can stop it. David Lighthouse was once a hard-hitting investigative reporter for the Denver Post. Back before he was accused of the brutal murder of his fiancée, his life unraveled. Now, he suddenly finds himself the target of sinister supernatural forces as he tracks down a conspiracy to release an ancient evil upon an unsuspecting world. Buy The Oldest Enemy by Michael J. Webb, now available at Amazon.com. Visit www.comein.ws today. Train at home for a new career in healthcare. Take advantage of affordable tuition, short completion timelines, and graduate assistance. Over 65,000 students have chosen us for these benefits and many more. Our school's commitment to quality ensures that graduates have the skills they need to succeed in their new career. Our courses include medical transcription and editing, medical coding and billing, pharmacy technician with Walgreens and CVS externships available, computer technician, medical administrative assisting, medical billing, administrative assisting, and more. Our programs are all approved for MyCAA funding, which can completely cover the costs for eligible military spouses. Students in the Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec can also enroll in select programs. Learn more. Visit www.comein.ws today. That's www.comein.ws. Visit today. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ellie Marzulli. You're listening to Acceleration Radio on the Fringe Radio Network. Great to be here. Uh, let me continue um, this hour-long monologue special edition of Acceleration Radio because of everything that is happening. I have really not had a chance to vent since the election, and of course I'm doing this. Uh, quick commercial, Watchers 5 is pretty much available. We're not doing pre-sales with it now. Um, it's, it's going to be shipping in about six to seven days. Um, it is in production. It is finished. It is 90 minutes long. It is the most ambitious of the Watchers series that we have done. And you can go to my website, www.lamarzulli.net, lamarzulli.net, and um, check that out for yourselves. Um, by the way, I will be at the Lionheart Ministries with Randy the Main this weekend, November 15th through the 18th. That is on the blog. If you're in the area, it's in Tennessee. And, in fact, I'm going to go there right now, and let me just give you an idea of what's happening there. Yes, there we are. So um, it's at the Knoxville Airport. Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, it's, it's at the Knoxville Airport Courtyard Marriott. It's conference room 141. Um, we are meeting on uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. I'll be kicking off tomorrow evening. And then Friday, I'll be speaking 9.30 and 2, and 2 p.m. Um, and the Saturday, I'll have both sessions. And then um, uh, apparently advanced seating has sold out already. So it's going to be a, a rollicking good time with Randy Demain and myself. Really looking forward to that. Uh, in the area, um, you know, try to try to get there. But advanced seating has sold out already for this conference. I am, for one, I'm really looking forward to uh, to being there. And I'll be speaking Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Lots of yak. So if you're in the area, folks, um, try to get there. You can go to my web a blog site rather because it's on that, and that's uh, www.lamarzuli.wordpress. Dot com. Uh, remember, this is a pre-recorded show here today. I'll be speaking uh, tomorrow, actually, during my normal Acceleration Radio show. So that's why uh, my good friend and producer Rick and I are, are doing the uh, <clears throat> doing the show today. Let me see what I got here. Just make sure that this is good. All right, here we are. Um, what most of the news media does not really get into in regard to the coming 
uh, war in the Middle East is the fact that uh, over the weekend, this past weekend, over 110 missiles were fired from Gaza into Israel. Now let's just take this thing and dial it in in a really clear way so everybody's on the same page. Let's say you lived in El Paso, Texas, okay? And, you know, you got your kids going to school in El Paso, and, you know, you, they want up soccer moms are taking the kids and baseball games and football games and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, from Mexico, you know, not one, not 10, not 20 or 30, not even 80, but over 110 missiles fly in to El Paso, Texas. What do you do? What do you do, folks? You just sit there and go, oh, it's okay. Oh, I just love these missiles. Kids, they have some of the border towns have 30 seconds from when the sirens go off to get into a shelter. That's how close it is. You see? That's how close Hamas is, who, who are entrenched in Gaza, from the Israeli border town. And then, of course, we get this whole deal. Well, the Israelis have no right to the land, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's walk through that one real quick because I have this knucklehead on my website, and I'm not going to tell you who it is, um, you know, which is constantly trying to tell me that it, it's, all, it's all the Israelis' fault. If Israel just somehow wasn't there, there would be no uh, war and everything would be hunky-dory in the Middle East. Baloney. You want to know what the Middle East is? Look at Iraq, where Sunni and Shia violence continues, even after we've withdrawn about every 7 to 15 days, right, within a week or two weeks, yet another suicide bomber blows him or herself up and kills 80, 100 people because the Sunni Muslims hate the Shia Muslims, and that's what's going on here. And what we see is the Shia crescent with Iran, um, um, you know, Syria, and Lebanon are posing a, a, a threat to the Sunni Muslims who have long dominated the, the Muslim world. What the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is after is establishing an Islamic caliphate from Pakistan to Spain with Jerusalem at its capital. But let's go back in time to history to World War I because most people don't even understand this. Unless we understand how the Middle East was formed, we, we're not informed at all and we have no business talking about it. It basically happens like this. That the entire region, as we know as the Middle East today, was, prior to World War I, controlled by the Ottoman Turks, by the Turkish Empire. They held sway over that area for over 400 years. They sided with the Germans during World War I. We know what happened. Germany lost. The victors, which basically were Britain, Britain and France, came into the area and took the spoils. They carved up the Middle East and created the states, the modern states that we see today of Syria, Lebanon, Israel, even parts of Egypt, you can make a strong case, Jordan and Iraq. And Iraq. Doug Hamp presents a wonderful presentation, uh, a PowerPoint, when he talks about the, the, the prophecy. When you see Israel, when you see the fig tree and all the trees, budding you know that this is the time of the end well israel is the fig tree and all the other trees are those nations now that budded all about the same time that fulfills biblical prophecy but here's the deal somehow it's okay for syria and iraq and lebanon and jordan and egypt they those are legitimate states but no oh we can't have israel can we i say this if we want to go back to, you know, we want to say that Israel has no claim to the land, then we need to do this. We need to go back to the Ottoman Empire and get rid of Syria and Iraq and all these sovereign nations that surround Israel. If it's good for Israel, by golly, it's good for the rest of those nations too. You see, and that's the problem. The problem is Israel's right to exist at all. There is a direct existential threat. The, the, the Islamists hate Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood hates Israel. We have a clip of, of President Morsi, who is mo part of the Muslim Brotherhood, who has recently said amen to when an imam, which is like a, a pastor or a priest in the Islamic religion, is standing up and calling for the destruction of the Jews. 
When Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says that Zionism, that, that Israel will soon be destroyed. And please don't write me, folks, with this ridiculous thing about, you know, the, uh, the synagogue of Satan. If you actually read what the scripture says, it says, those who call themselves Jews but are not. Oh, isn't that convenient that certain researchers like our good friend over there, Tex Mars, who happens to be rabidly anti-Semitic and rabidly anti-Israel, and I'll say it on the air because it's freedom of free speech, and I'm not calling him out. I'm just saying, hey, Tex, maybe you should rethink some of your theory because it's wrong. Israel, if, if, if God has made a mistake and regathered the Jews from the four corners of the earth, just like he said he would prior to his son's second coming, and which fulfills the prophecy of Ezekiel 37 in part. If that's if he made a mistake, then who the heck are these people? And don't give me the nonsense about the Khazarians. That's absolute baloney. Hitler knew who the Jews were, didn't he? And he managed to kill six million of them. He didn't equivocate, well, these are the Khazarians. We can't kill them. He killed them all. And six million. And it's in my book, The Cosmic Chess Match. Had he been successful, he would have wiped out every Jew on the planet. And there's a reason for this. There's a supernatural dynamic here because Hitler knows if he can wipe out every single Jew on the planet, prophecy will not be fulfilled. God is a liar. Follow me. Follow the fallen one. Follow Satan. That's, where, that's what was at stake at World War II. And now in these last days, and I believe, folks, with all my heart, that we are in the birth pangs. And look, I've been, I've been blabbing this thing since 2010. And I've got it documented. 2010, something had shifted. And I felt it in my spirit. And I went on a limb and I wrote about it. From 2011 to the present day, the birth pains continue and continue and continue with earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors of wars. Remember, when it talks about earthquakes, it says, Jesus says, there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. 2,000 years ago, there's no way to track any of that. How the heck are you going to know where an earthquake is in Japan if you live in Palestine? You wouldn't. The only way you would hear about it, maybe a year later, some by chance, some trading vessel or some caravan comes by and goes, wow, there was a big earthquake in Japan. But that's it. Now we watch it in real time. When the Fukushima disaster happened, we watched the tidal wave come in because there were helicopters beaming things on satellite basically in, in real time. That's unprecedented. That fulfills biblical prophecy. We're here. These are the birth pangs, folks. We are here. We are in it up to our eyeballs. And all eyes are on Israel. The clown of the week, of course, is the whole Petraeus affair. Look at Petraeus, 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 right? And that this will probably last two weeks. What is alarming about this, though, it's really more than a clown. As Charles Crosshammer in his, um, uh, I, I linked this on, on Wednesdays, um, uh, it basically said, Crosshammer, White House held a fair over Petraeus' head for favorable testimony on Benghazi. If that's true... If that's true, if we're Cro Charles Crothheimer, who's a brilliant, brilliant columnist, and he's, he's, you know, the guy is amazing. He really is amazing. If that's true, of course, all this was, was not brought out by the weasels in the screen media before the election. And uh, here we are. And now this huge scandal is here. But what, again, this is in some way obfuscates what's really happening, and that is World War III. If World War III erupts, it really erupts over there. And if it's not just a skirm skirmish with Hamas and Israel, which is what is now. Now, in other words, look, Israel responds to 110 rocket attacks over, over the border towns. And I've already kind of talked about that. And they begin to take out um, Hamas leadership, okay? And now Hamas is calling for its war. Okay, fine. So now it's war. So does that mean Hamas calls up Hezbollah and Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Iran? Where is it, where's, what's really going to happen here? We don't know. We have no clue. I mean, there's a lot of saber rattling going on. But it, it's funny how Hamas just immediately goes, oh, you killed one of our men, it's war. Well, Hamas, you fired 110 missiles into Israel. What are they supposed to do, sit down and do nothing? Come on. Come on. You know, you can't have it both ways. You're going to start launching missiles, Israel's going to attack. Is Israel 100% lily white clean? Of course they're not. Of course, stuff happens. Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't. But, you know, it all gets back to the, the idea of Israel's right to the land, of Israel um, being, being a nation. And the fact is that the Islamists don't want that. They want to kill every single Jew. And again, I've already made this point. If, that, if, if Israel has no right to the land, then neither does Syria or Lebanon or Jordan or really any place else. Let's just all go back to the way it was under the Ottoman Empire. How about that? Hmm. That's not going to fly, folks. That's not going to fly. 
I believe that, and I have no way of knowing because I don't have a crystal ball, this is more than likely a, a skirmish. Um, I doubt that it, that it is the beginning of World War III, but it could be. Things could escalate very, very quickly. Here's a couple of scenarios to think about. Hezbollah in the north has, been, has retrofitted many of their missiles, and they've upgraded from the Katushas to Grad missiles now. Some of these missiles, Intel, the Intel that I've, that's come across my desk, and there's no way to vet some of this stuff. But allegedly, uh, some of these missiles have been fitted with chemical war weapons, uh, either from Saddam's stockpile or uh, Syria's stockpile. If chemical weapons are used against Israel, they will retaliate. It'll get nasty very quickly. The player to watch, of course, is the Russian bear. They're sort of backing Syria. Uh, Turkey is, is in the fray here. Iran has stated over and over and over again that they will close the Strait of Hormuz. Isn't it interesting? And I've talked about this before, but I'll bring it up again. That before Iran, before the Strait of Hormuz was ever mentioned in the news media, I was banging that drum on the blog clearly over a year and a half ago, saying that the Iranians had one um, offensive maneuver, and that was to close the Strait of Hormuz, which brings in about, 80, about 40, 30 to 40 to 50 percent of the world's oil. Oil is the lifeblood of the planet. Close the Strait of Hormuz, and guess what? You've, you've crippled or at least put a dent in the U.S. and the, and the global economy, and that's what the Iranians will do. Um, a lot of bluster over there. Uh, it, make no mistake about this, we have the firepower to bomb them back into the Stone Age, and we can certainly do that. Uh, let's hope that if we do go to war, it won't be like Libya, where Obama just declares that, well, this isn't a war, I'm just going to do this. Which leads me to a real quick segue, folks. We are, there's a shadow government, in my opinion. We live with, within, uh, uh, let, me, let me back that up. We are governed, I believe, by an industrial military complex that Eisenhower warned us about. The last real president we had in this country was, was JFK, uh, who was killed and assassinated. We're coming up on his uh, anniversary, uh, the 50th anniversary is in, is in 20, uh, yeah, 2013, so it's, it's going to be big next year, uh, very big. But um, very interesting to see what happens. I stood in the grassy knoll in 2012. We actually have a clip of that in Watchers 5. And uh, I got to tell you, folks, I believe, I believe that the headshot came from the grassy knoll area, specifically behind the picket fence. There, the X, which shows the, the, the kill shot, is less than 60 feet from where that fence is. It literally was a turkey shoot. And they killed Kennedy for three reasons. He was going to abolish um, the CIA, shatter it into a thousand pieces. We have that documented. He was going to, to dismantle the Federal Reserve. Okay? Wonderful idea. The Federal Reserve has nothing to do with our federal government. It's an international cartel of bankers which rules the currency. And that's what that's what's, has a chokehold on this nation even as I speak, folks. Even as I speak. The third thing was to get us out of Vietnam. All of this is documented. All of it. He also, two weeks before his assassination, gave a speech on secret societies and how they are abhorrent to the very fabric, the very nature of a free society. And yet we have Bohemian Grove, which happens now every year, and the Illumina, um, uh, Illuminati probably is behind this thing, uh, on, on some level at any rate. And the leaders of the nations all over the world are invited to this place. And it's not a mock sacrifice, in my opinion. It is a real human sacrifice which takes place. Why are these people there in front of an owl? Why go to some place where a mock human sacrifice takes place anyway? I mean, if you invited me there and said, oh, we're going to have a mock human sacrifice, I'd say, well, you're crazy. I'm leaving. Why is it that these leaders sit there under... A mock sacrifice, and I don't believe it's mock. I believe that there's a human sacrifice that happens year after year after year. Why is it so secretive that we can't see what's going on? This is what Kennedy was talking about. This is abhorrent to the very fabric of, of the American way of life. And yet here we have Bohemian Grove year after year after year. We live and we are governed by a military industrial complex. How do I know? There are over 700 military bases in operation globally. We are the world's global policemen. The Afghan war drags on and on and on. I have talked to servicemen who have come over there and I said, what in your opinion, off the record, no names will be mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the whole journalistic thing. What in your opinion, uh, was is, is the is, is the um, Afghan war? 
And all of them say the same thing. It's a waste of time. An absolute waste of time because it's an exercise in futility. It's just like Vietnam. Take the hill, give it back. Take the hill, give it back. Take the hill, give it back. Over and over and over and over again. Look, folks, I'm a patriot, but this Afghan war stuff is a bunch of hooey. You know, who profits from the $1 trillion opium harvest every year? Let's ask the question there. The fact that we have freedom of speech, which may not be for who knows how long, uh, you know, shows like this on the Internet may become a thing in the past because I'm actually challenging our government and saying that the war in Afghanistan is an unjust war. It is. It's an unjust war. I believe we have a shadow government. We are ruled by a military industrial complex. Before Obama took office, he said, bring our boys home from Afghanistan, close Guantanamo, bring our boys home from Iraq. Well, the Iraq thing happened, but we're still in Afghanistan and Guantanamo, last time I looked, was still in business. And there's probably torture and waterboarding is torture, despite what Bill O'Reilly says, with all due respect to him, waterboarding is torture. That's what it is. You know, why don't you sign up for waterboarding? If you don't think it's torture, that's waterboarding. Okay? That's waterboarding. And it's, it's controversial. That's called, you know, in, what is it, intense interrogation? Please, please. Home of the free, land of the brave? I don't know, folks. Getting back to the country. The country is in a very volatile situation. There is a great, dis, um, I would even say fear. In all my travels around, around America right now, every place I go, and when I have dinner with folks one on one with a, with a my wife and I travel together, and so you know a, a, another couple may take us out. It's always the same question. They kind of look around and go, "What do you think is going to happen?" And I say, "I don't know." Why do you ask? And they go, well, we're thinking about leaving the country. Where do we? Where do you go? I'm asked that. Where do you really go? No place is safe. It's all. It's a global. It's a global community. It is a global village, as Hillary Clinton likes to say. There's no place, no place safe. And I would say this to those of you who are thinking about this. Unless you get direct marching orders from God, don't do a knee-jerk reaction. Unless, of course, you know, you're fleeing. Uh, obviously, if, if, if you live on a border town and war breaks out, you leave. I get that, right? But the rest, for the rest of us, and I know I've said talking about leaving the country, and a friend of mine, you know, said, get out now, L.A., before, you know, the first of the year and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, if I get marching orders from the man upstairs, I will. But how do I know that I'm not in the most safest place in and, and, and God's perfect will? I don't. I believe I am. Otherwise, he would have said something. So right now, I'm not going to move, and I'm not going to, to become an expat and leave the country. But I'm very concerned. I love our country. I love America. I love the Constitution. I love the principles on which America was founded and the Constitution, uh, which I believe is one of the greatest documents ever to come down the pike next to the Bible. Martin Luther King could point to the Constitution, but he pointed to the Bible first and basically said this, and I'm paraphrasing, if I'm wrong, then the Constitution's wrong. All men are not created equal. If I'm wrong, then the Bible is wrong. And we're not all made in the image and likeness of God. And how do you argue with that? It takes the two greatest documents on the planet, the Bible and the Constitution together. Wow. Wow. Look, democracy and freedom, our forefathers paid a price for this. And we see it slipping away day after day after day in this country. Great unrest. I want to move back into the Middle East here. And we got another five minutes. I'm going to cut it short today. We're only going to do 50 minutes, and I'm going to close out. Um, uh, and, and we'll see you again next week. Actually, next week is uh, Thanksgiving, so I'm not sure what we're going to do. We'll probably just run an old show. I, I want to say this, that um, anything is possible in the Middle East. We could see Syria jump into the fray, Hezbollah jump into the fray, which is, I got sidetracked. I apologize for that. But Hezbollah is armed to the teeth, um, sworn enemy of Israel. They have rebuilt since the 2007 um, uh, Lebanon uh, ad adventure with Israel went in and, and wiped them out to a point. They rebuilt. They've d they're dug in. They've got between forty and one hundred and ten thousand missiles, depending on whose intel you want to believe. Uh, Syria is in uh, a huge, huge imbroglio right now, and anything is possible there. Anything is possible there. So all eyes. Remember, there's a saying in the Middle East which says, "The enemy of my enemy is my friend." And with that in mind, folks, the enemy of my enemy. Uh, Sunni and Shia will lay down their differences to attack Israel jointly. And there's a prophecy 
which I pretty much I, I include pretty much on a daily basis on the blog lamarzuli.wordpress.com. And when I say a prophecy, it's more like a word of knowledge, which I received at Cornerstone Fellowship when I was in a worship service there. And for those of you who don't travel, and that that's fine. But I felt that the uh, the man upstairs, the, the real God, sort of tapped me on the shoulder and gave me a word, and it was this: Be still and know that I am God. Behold, the days are coming when I will show my strength on the mountains of Israel. Be still and know that I am God. Behold, the days are coming when I will show my strength on the mountains of Israel. And folks, um, with all that is going on in the world, I want to end with this, that being still means that we know, that we, we rest, we, we, we stop, we wait on him, we pause, we reflect, we wait on him. Uh, and, and understand that he is in control. Now, today we're supposed to be fasting and praying. It's called stand in the gap, and I waited to the end to talk about that. I believe that prayer changes things. I believe if a group of us, and I want these numbers to swell into the millions, and not just be, I, I'm hoping that other hosts and other radio shows and other people, other churches, other pastors will begin to do this on the day of their choosing. We're doing it on Thursday because of the radio show, and we can talk about it. Stand in the gap. Fast and pray. Pray for this nation. Pray for our president. Pray for our leaders. Pray that God would forgive us, literally would forgive us for the, the Holocaust, the abortion Holocaust, the 53 million whose blood cries out from him from the ground, just like Abel's blood cries out uh, to God from the ground thousands of years ago when Abel slew him. Murder is murder. You know, we, we can tap dance around the bush all we want, but that's what it is. And the 53 million. So when we go to pray, when we, as we stand in the gap, let's confess nationally. Let's confess our sins, but also confess the sins of a nation and ask for grace and mercy and ask that the God of our fathers would show. Ask for revival in this country. Ask that God would one last time move through and that people would repent. It's happened before and it can happen again, but it starts with prayer. It starts with us fasting and praying together. I know Russ Dizdar is going to do the same thing. He's going to implement it, I think, next month, calling people to, to fast and pray for the country. That's our offensive weapon. You know, demonstrations are good, you know, peaceful demonstrations, okay? Petitions are good, peaceful, peaceful petitions. I get that. All that's good. But nothing, nothing should ever usurp the power of prayer and fasting. And we're called to do that from a biblical standpoint, a biblical paradigm. It says, if my people humble themselves and fast and pray, then I will hear their prayers from heaven and I will answer them. I will answer them. I'm paraphrasing here. But there's a promise. And we serve the God, the real one. Let's go to him in prayer. Let's see if we can turn the nation around. There are millions of us who believe in him, despite what Obama says, that it's no longer a Christian nation. Baloney, it is a Christian nation, Mr. Obama. With all due respect, sir, it is a Christian nation. It is a Christian nation. We've lost our way. We've lost our voice, perhaps. But it is a Christian nation. And unlike the Muslim countries, specifically in Egypt and other, other areas, which kill their Christian inhabitants, and I'm speaking of um, some, some uh, uh, African nations, which are going village to village, killing Christians, we don't do that here in this country. The Islamists can come here and set up shop and, and set up their, uh, have their imams preach hate, and we allow that. We allow that which in some ways is a Trojan horse, but I digress. Fast and pray, folks. Fast and pray for this country. Stand in the gap with me. I'm just one guy. I'm nobody. And, and neither are you. But collectively, as, as we hold our prayers up together, you know, we can change things. And I hope that that happens. Please continue to pray for Crystal, who is battling leukemia. Um, she's on the blog site now. And I'm going to start a section um, I can't do this exhaustively, but for those who um, on the blog that, that visit the blog or shoot me an email, and we will try to get some of these prayer requests up, we'll have a little section uh, on the blog called, you know, Daily Priest Pray For. And right now we've got Crystal and Carrie. Carrie is recovering from surgery, um, and oxygen levels were low. Please keep her in prayer. And Crystal, um, I find myself praying for these people all day long, literally. As, as it's brought up into my spirit all day long, I, I find myself praying for Crystal or praying for Carrie. 
and uh, it's wonderful how when it's spirit led, it's not it's not a task, it's not a burden. The spirit presses that need on our hearts, and we we willfully, we thankfully do it. Keep these keep these women in prayer. Crystal was battling leukemia, and Carrie, who was recovering from surgery. Folks, you're listening to Acceleration Radio. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, with a little update on Stan in the Gap. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll update on, I'm not sure how, what we're going to do uh, on Thanksgiving. Um, we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll do it on Wednesday next week instead of Thursday. I'm not sure. Uh, I will be gone uh, tomorrow. I will be at the Lionheart Ministries uh, speaking with Randy Demain at the Nephilim Agenda Conference is what it's called. Advanced Seating has sold out. Um, this conference is going to be pretty cool if you ask me from from what's what's going on it is right at the knoxville airport courtyard marriott uh in the alcoa conference room so it's um it's going to be really cool i'm excited about it and um it's going to be really great i hope to see you there uh randy demain will be speaking with me and of course worship will be by brian and ramey whalen i've never heard them but i'm sure that's going to be exciting too so uh, i will be there and uh, hope to see you there uh, I'll be flying in tomorrow. I'll be speaking tomorrow evening, Friday and Saturday. Sunday, flying flying to Oklahoma City on Monday and filming a, um, a TV show with our, our good friend uh, and um, Gary Stearman. And, of course, it be great to see Bob Ulrich there also. And Richard Shaw, my co friend and co-producer of the Watcher series, will be flying in for this interview, too, um, at Prophecy of the News. And then I'll be back on Wednesday the day before Thanksgiving, folks, we are headed to Chichen Itza, uh, December 13th. Russ, Russ Dizdar, Richard Grun, Larry Barrett, and myself, we will be filming the events down there. Uh, we're excited about that. We're probably going to make a documentary about uh, what we see at Chichen Itza. I will certainly be writing about it, and we covered your prayers for that little trip. For those who have contributed beforehand, we want to thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, folks, for listening to Acceleration Radio. It's been great. Uh, I sort of got... Uh, almost an hour of information out here, and I, I think I would do this, folks. We need to we need to stay in prayer, stand in the gap for this country, but also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's it for tonight, folks. You're listening to Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, off to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, tomorrow for that conference. And remember, folks, I will see.